read with you Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, blessings. I have to admit, it feels a little bit different uh, this morning. Certainly some more elbow room uh, in here. A little bit different not having uh, the members of Mercy worshiping with us this morning, but the good news is that even though people may come and go, uh, the Word of God remains the same. And so our routine as a church will remain the same. We will spend our Sundays opening the Word and preaching the Word. And we're doing so right now through Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, full disclosure, I have to admit that Paul's letter to the Philippians is my favorite book uh, in the entire Bible. Um, I read it often, and I have these great ambitions of one day committing the entire letter to memory. Now, those are ambitions. That hasn't quite happened. But, but that's my desire. And the reason I desire it is because I, I want... I, I want these words, the Word of God, I, I want these words to be imprinted and, and fixed upon my heart and on my soul. The letter to the Philippians gives us such a rich, rich picture of what it means to lead a gospel-centered life, of what it means to live with a gospel perspective. And the truth is, the reality is that often in my life, I have these times where I end up not leading a gospel-centered life. Often I have these times where, where, where I kind of shift and, and I kind of deviate from keeping Christ at the center of my life, and I need to be reminded of that. I love what Tim Keller says. Tim Keller has this quote where he says, you know, at the end of the day when you're done reading the Bible, there are just two questions that remain. Is it about me or is it about Jesus? And so I pray that as we work through this letter of Paul to the Philippians, that we would be reminded again to really, really keep Christ at the center of it all. We're going to read this morning from verse 12. Um, I have a bit of an admission to make. I started the week uh, with this plan to preach from Philippians 1, the verses uh, 12 through 30, and then I cut it down to Philippians 1, verse 12 to 26, and then this morning I woke up and I realized that this is uh, crazy. I'm just going to preach Philippians 1, verse 12 to 18. Um, I have these times where for the sake of a schedule, and a certain you know, established pattern that we've set up, I'm convinced that we're just going to push through. But I really want to try and do justice to the Word of God this morning, so we're going to just focus on the verses 12 to 18. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear through throughout the whole palace garden, to everyone else, that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more 
to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chain. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. This is the word of the Lord. I know this morning that some of you are, are here catching up on this uh, for the first time, and so I want to take just a couple of minutes to try and, and get you up to speed uh, with where we're at. As I mentioned earlier, this is a letter that Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Now, the church uh, at Philippi was one of just many churches that Paul had established over the course of his life. After Paul's conversion, uh, after Paul's Damascus Road experience, after his encounter with Jesus Christ, Paul became this guy who was just sold out, entirely devoted to traveling the world and telling people about Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you this map this morning because I kind of want you to visualize, I want you to visualize what this actually looked like for Paul. Paul is a guy that throughout the ministry, he, he went on, on three missionary journeys. And scholars have kind of read about these missionary journeys and they've, they've done the math, they've mapped things out, and they figure that over the course of his life, that Paul traveled about 10,000 miles for the cause of Christ. I read that and I felt kind of sheepish about my own efforts. I travel 14 kilometers to church and I have a car. So it's not really comparable. Right? Paul, Paul was so, he was so committed to just traveling wherever and to whoever so that people could hear the news of Jesus what he would do is, is he would go and he would kind of do this loop, and you could see that a little bit. He kind of had this pattern that he followed, this loop that he followed, and he would go around, he'd preach, he'd establish new churches, and, and he'd encourage and teach, but he'd also visit some of the established churches, and he'd exhort and admonish and lead them and encourage them. And when he was done his loop, he would just kind of start up again, and he'd go around one more time, right? Just entirely committed to the advance of the gospel, and so what you need to understand when you're reading a letter like Philippians, one of the things that you need to understand is that these new churches like Philippi and these new Christians, they, they relied on a guy like Paul. And, and, and they leaned on him. And they looked to him so much for advice and for guidance and for wisdom but as they get this letter, the, the, the thing is that Paul has not been able to be with them for a really long time. What happened is that after Paul's third missionary journey, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. Paul's arrested in Jerusalem, and you can read about this Acts 21 through 28. You can do that sometimes. It's helpful. But what happens is that, that Paul is arrested, and he's transferred to Caesarea. And he spends two years in prison in Caesarea, and then he exerts his right. Paul was a Roman citizen, and so what Paul did is he exerted his right to appeal for a trial before Caesar. And what that meant, what that meant long term, was basically that he had to be transferred to Rome. Now, all of Paul's journeys involved a lot of hardship. I think more hardship than we could possibly imagine. But this last journey, which is kind of highlighted in the red, this last journey from Jerusalem to Rome is kind of on a different level altogether. Right? Paul, Paul is, is taken on the ship. He's going to travel to Rome. Along the way, there's a storm. Storm hits, the boat sinks. Not good. Right? Paul ends up being stranded on this island. And then while he's on the island, he's out searching for wood for a fire. He gets bitten by a poisonous snake. It's just it's like the worst trip ever. Anyway, Paul ends up in Rome. And so it's been three or four years probably, think about this, three or four years since the Philippians have actually seen Paul 
and they're worried about him. And they're not just worried about his future. They're worried about the future of the gospel. Right? They had this gospel which was going to transform lives and change hearts and change peoples and save sinners that was going to change the world. They're kind of wondering what's going to happen now. And so Paul, in this passage, Paul writes to them because he wants them to learn to trust God in this. Right? He's not denying the reality of his situation and how hard it is, but he's saying, let's, let's trust God in this. And he offers two reasons why they can trust, and they're really centered on the gospel. And what I want to do this morning in our time together is I just want to focus on those two reasons on why we really can place our trust in the gospel. And the first is this. Because the power of the gospel cannot be contained by chain. It's the first thing that Paul teaches them. Paul says this. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So, Imagine this, you have this Philippian church and they're concerned about Paul. And they're concerned about him, I think we could say rightfully so. I mean, he's been through a lot and, and somehow kind of through the grapevine, they've heard about what's gone on. They've heard about his suffering, they've heard about his imprisonment, they've heard about uh, the, the, the shipwreck, you know, the whole being bit by a snake. This, this, they're just like, they're concerned about him. So what they end up doing is they send a guy named Epaphroditus. Okay, that's the context of Philippians. They send Epaphroditus to visit Paul in Rome because they, they, they kind of want to check in on him and see how he's doing. And so you have to imagine Epaphroditus coming to Paul and he kind of says to Paul, Paul, how are you? Paul, we, we've heard about what's happened. Like, how are you holding up? But instead of Paul saying, hey, let's talk about me, the beautiful thing about this passage is that Paul says, let's talk about the gospel. Right? Let's put the focus where it needs to be. He says this, he says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, the word that, that Paul uses there for the whole palace guard, it's, it's a word praetorium, and maybe some of you history buffs out there know that, that the praetorium was a word that referred to Caesar's personal guard. Okay, so this was, this was like, it was a word, this was Caesar's personal troops. They were probably several thousand in number. And what their job was, among other things, one of their jobs at least, was to guard and to watch the prisoners who were going to appear on trial before Caesar. Now the way that this was done, it's kind of interesting, the way that this was done was a bit different than we might imagine. Often the way that this was done was that the prisoner would be shackled to the guard. Okay, so you follow? So the, the guard would come and he would just shackle himself to the prisoner. Great way for him not to get away. And this would typically be done for, for 12 hours at a time. Now for most of us, for most of us, that's kind of a negative thing, if you imagine that. Uh, being shackled by the wrist to some guy for 12 hours at a time. I wonder, how do you sleep? That's kind of awkward. But Paul, Paul sees this as a golden evangelism opportunity. Paul's like, so you're telling me some guy is going to be shackled to me for 12 hours at a time. I can just imagine Paul, hey, uh, have you heard about Jesus? <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus. Guy's trying to go to sleep. Hey, before you sleep, I'd just like to share something about Jesus. These poor guys didn't have a chance. But Paul, so Paul's excited. Right? He says, God is doing good things. And he carries on. He says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul says, because of the suffering that I've been through, 
because of the hardships I've endured, God has actually given me an opportunity and God has given me the strength to be loyal to Christ, even in this. And it's this supernatural strength, you know, that from the outside looking in, this supernatural strength in the face of suffering that causes other Christians in Rome to look and just to be emboldened in their own loyalty to Christ. You know, and God often does that through the faithful witness of suffering saints. Now, I don't want to give the impression this morning that Paul enjoyed suffering. Okay, and I know we like to tell this story, but I don't want to give the impression that Paul enjoyed suffering. When he was in prison, not easy. Right, the whole shipwreck story, it was hard. Right, Paul didn't enjoy suffering, but he always saw suffering in terms of an opportunity to point to Christ. And God used that in a remarkable way to advance the gospel. There's something interesting I think we're noting. At the end of Philippians, in Philippians 4, verse 22, here's what we read there. Paul's closing the letter to the Philippians, and he says this, All God's people here send you greetings especially those who belong to Caesar's household. It's interesting that the Philippians were worried because they thought that somehow with Paul locked up, that this would end up kind of containing and limiting the gospel. When in fact it was exactly these chains that God used to bring the gospel directly into the home of the emperor. And I fear that Sometimes, sometimes we're tempted to kind of believe this lie that, that somehow no, no good can come out of suffering. This idea that somehow God can't use difficulties and sorrow and trials, that somehow God can't use that ultimately to be a blessing. But when you live with a gospel perspective, when you start to see things truly in terms of Jesus, you discover that that's just not true. And we don't always understand it perfectly, but God works in profound ways and often through suffering. I want to illustrate this for you this morning. I want to show you this map. This is a map of the World Watch List 2019. Some of you have seen it before. It's produced by an organization called Open Doors USA. It's a group that surveys Christians around the world. And basically what it does is it determines uh, through this list the 50 countries in which Christianity is persecuted the most. All right, so these are the 50 countries in which Christianity is persecuted the most. They're listed in order of severity with North Korea being at the top. These are places where Christians face pressure Sometimes social, uh, social pressure, economic pressure. These are places where Christians face violence, where they face uh, death on account of their loyalty to Christ. Now, I decided this week to compare this list with a list of the 40 countries where Christianity is growing the most. And this is what you discover. Check this out. 23 of the countries in which Christianity is growing and advancing the fastest are on this list of 50 countries where Christianity is persecuted the most. What I find particularly interesting is that in seven of the 10 countries in which the persecution is most severe, it's exactly the places where the gospel is growing by leaps and bounds. It's as if people are, are trying to close down one church over here and three more pop up elsewhere. And that's because the truth is you, you can't lock up, you can't chain up the power of the gospel. You, you, you can't lock up someone's loyalty and someone's love for Christ. You can't chain that. 
I find this remarkable. But I also did one other thing. I compared it this week, this list. I also compared it with the 40 countries in which Christianity is slowing or declining the most. Now, it's a bit difficult to see on this map, but they're highlighted with the red arrows. And what you discover is that all of these countries where Christianity is slowing and declining are exactly the places where Christians face minimal persecution. Places like North America, places all over Europe, Places like Australia, these places that used to be kind of the heartbeat, the backbone of Christianity, are exactly the places where Christianity seems to be in decline. And you wonder, why is that? Well, I think it's because in so many of these places, somehow we think we've advanced past our need for Jesus Christ. In so many of these places, we, we, we have decided to satisfy ourselves with other things. And we fill our lives with, with all of these things and we pursue all of these other pleasures. And what we do is we, we build these countries which, which economically are advanced and which we're growing and which we're superior to many other countries in the world. And it's got this nice shiny veneer over it. Right? These countries where so often things look good. And you know, pardon the expression, but I really think that it's like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean that. And I think often we do that in our own lives. We pursue these things. And we acquire things. And we experience things. And we invest in things. Thinking that somehow in all of these things we're actually going to find joy and meaning but we don't actually understand the bigger problem. Right? The reality is that we live in a broken world. And we live in a world with broken people. And the reason that we live in a world that is broken, and the reason that we live in a world with broken people is because there is the reality of sin. And the only way that you actually deal with the reality of sin is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And I think it's worth noting when you consider the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, I think it's worth noting that for, for much of his ministry, Jesus was loved. For much of his ministry, Jesus was, was admired. Thousands came to hear him. And they loved what he offered. Right? He fed the hungry. He fed the 5,000. The lame walked. The blind could see. The guy with the withered hand has his, has his hand restored. Jesus casts out demons. He heals lepers. And people love it. Never forget that Jesus came into Jerusalem hailed as a king because they saw in him someone who could alleviate, someone who could lift the burden of their suffering. You know when they turned on Jesus Christ? They turned on him when he confronted them with the reality of their sin and of their need for a Savior. That they could not bear. And for that, they sent him to the cross. And Jesus went to that cross because of the reason that he wasn't content to just alleviate people's suffering. What he wanted to do was to, to break the power. He wanted to break the chains that sin held over people's lives. The power that sin holds in your life and my life. And Jesus went to the cross to crush it. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
And I think it's just so important that we remember that as a church. I think we should care deeply about the suffering that we see around us in the world. And I think we should strive and serve in whatever capacity God places us to alleviate and do what we can to ease the burdens and the hardships that people struggle with. We should care about suffering because Christ cared about suffering. But at the same time, we never stop there. Right? But we want to confront people with the reality of sin and of their desperate need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. And that message at times will be mocked. At that time, there, there will be times where it's just foolishness to people. But to those who are being saved, it will be the power of God, a liberating force that changes their lives for today and for eternity. And that power cannot be contained. I want to go back to verse 15 now. We read there, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but, but others out of goodwill. It becomes clear here that there's um, some tension that the Philippians have heard about, and it, it appears to be a tension between two groups that, that, that are preaching Christ. And the Philippians seem worried uh, that, that, that this one group is going to somehow subvert the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul teaches this lesson. Here's the second lesson for today. That the purpose of the gospel is not controlled by people. The purpose of the gospel is not controlled by people. Paul says, yes, there are these two groups. One of them is preaching the message of the gospel for, for good reasons. The other is preaching so out of envy. He says, the latter, do so out of, sorry, the, the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. I find those verses uh, remarkable. Right? Here you have Paul, and, and he, he's, he's got these Philippians that are worried about these two groups that are competing. And we don't know exactly who this group is. There are some commentators that argue that they were uh, Judaizers, that they were what you might call um, Jewish Christians who, who believed in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they kind of had this view that said, well, you need Jesus Christ and you need some of these other things. You need to follow some of these Jewish traditions. But I'm not sure that that actually fits the bill. I'm not sure that that makes sense within the context of this letter. Because Paul is dealing with that group specifically when he writes another church in Galatia. And when he writes, notice what he says in Galatians 1 verse 6. He says this, I'm astonished. That's what he says to the church there. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. That response to the Galatians seems a whole lot different than the approach that Paul takes with the Philippians. I think the sense that we get is that this, this group that's preaching in Rome, that, that they're not a group of heretics. Okay, they're, they're, they're not a group that, that, that are preaching some false gospel. They are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The problem is that they're doing so for the wrong reasons. Paul uses this phrase in this chapter where he says um, that, that, that they are um, 
They're, they're preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me. That phrase, stir up trouble, is actually, um, it's a phrase which can be translated as, as afflict. Right? It seems like their motivation here in this passage, the reason they're, they're, they're preaching Christ, has to do with Paul, and particularly their jealousy of Paul. See, you remember when I was talking about all those churches? You have to think about this. You have all of these churches established, and they love Paul. And they rely so heavily on Paul, and they look to Paul, and they admire Paul. And they're so discouraged at this point. They're sending Epaphroditus because they're so discouraged about where Paul's at. And the sense that you seem to get is that these preachers who had the selfish ambition that they preach because they want to be Paul. They preach the gospel, sure. They preach Christ, but it's because they want to be admired the way that Paul was admired. They want people to look to them the way that they looked to Paul. They want people to rely on them the way that people relied on Paul. And so they're not preaching so that people can see Christ. They're preaching so that people can see them. And I just want to be honest with you. That this, this is a temptation. This is a temptation that faces all preachers. I think it's a temptation that faces me. I think it's a temptation that faces Pastor Bill, that faces Pastor Ian. You know, we have these opportunities, and we're really thankful for them. We have these opportunities to go to some amazing conferences uh, during the year. We go to the Gospel Coalition sometimes. We go to uh, the Basics Conference. We go to the Ligonier's Conference. And you hear these amazing guys preach. You hear John Piper. You hear Tim Keller. You hear David Platt, Alistair Begg, wonderful wonderful preachers of the gospel, people that God has used profoundly for the advance of Christ's kingdom. But it's kind of funny, when you leave, there are times where there's this little voice that says, wouldn't it be nice to be them? I wouldn't. What would it be like you know, if that many people came to hear me, and what, what would it be like if, if people relied on me, if people read my blogs the way that they read Piper? Right? What would that be like? And it becomes so easy that instead of preaching so that people can see Christ, you preach so that people see you. I remember some of you probably do as well that at my ordination service when I began ministry, which would be three years ago, Pastor Bill preached a sermon, and that title of that sermon was, Sir, We Want to See Jesus. And one of you, who I won't name, but one of you uh, was kind enough to make me a sign that says, that's the phrase, Sir, We Want to See Jesus, and it sits over my computer as a constant reminder, as a constant reminder of the temptation of pride. And it's so real. Over the last five years, over the last five years, we have seen some incredibly prominent preachers, very, very well known, some of whom I admired, some of them I envied who have fallen into incredible moral failure because somewhere along the way, instead of the preaching being about Christ, it became about them. And I think that can be so discouraging for us. It's discouraging for me as a pastor when I read it. And I think this passage reminds us and encourages us to remember that the, purple, the purpose of the gospel, that came out wrong, the purpose of the gospel is not controlled 
by people. I want to close with just a couple of things. I don't want to leave you with the impression that we shouldn't care about motives. I think Paul cared deeply about motives. I don't want to leave the impression that we shouldn't care about theology or biblical faithfulness. I think if you read anything, if you know anything about Paul, he cared a lot about faithfulness and about being theologically consistent. I think those things mattered to him a great deal, but what he had the wisdom to realize is that God can use broken, weak, sinful people, sinful preachers even, to bring people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. The other thing I was thinking about was this last phrase. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And I just read that again and again and again. The important thing is that Christ is preached. The important thing is that Christ is preached. And I was thinking back to a few years ago when we began kind of our partnership here with Stanley Avenue Church. I remember during one of our first meetings, one of the members said this. They said, the most important thing to us is not that there is a Baptist church here, but that there, that, but that there is a faithful witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The important thing is that Christ is preached. And I have to think, and perhaps wonder, would we have said the same if the roles were reversed? I think that's a question that we need to consider. Are we willing to rejoice in the fact that people come to know Christ? Or are we only going to rejoice if people come to know Christ in our church with our particular doctrinal distinctives? I pray that we would be a church that continues to keep Christ at the center, loving the word, striving for faithfulness, striving to be committed, but holding to the truth and the centrality of the gospel. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we Thank you once again this morning that you give us the opportunity to just consider the gospel. The simple truth that you love sinners, that you love broken people, that you love weak people, and the beautiful truth that you use broken and weak people. And we pray this morning, Father, that as we reflect on the gift that you've given us in Jesus Christ, that you would open up our eyes by your Spirit to recognize our need. We recognize that we live in a world, we live in a culture where there is not a great deal of persecution, at least not overt persecution against the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, in so many ways, we gather in freedom, we don't have that many cares. And yet the truth is that those are often the things that allow us to fill our lives with things that are not central and to look to other things as our greatest need. And so, Father, we pray this morning that for those, of, for those here who don't know Jesus Christ, who perhaps come here and who've been looking to other places, who've been looking for other things, who've been pursuing all of these pleasures, we pray that you, by your Spirit, would use your Word to lead them to the cross so that they can repent and believe and that you forever will smash the chain and the power of sin that enslaves and that captivates our heart. And it, we, we want to pray this morning for the places in our city that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the places where people are called 
to faith and to submit their lives to the Lord and Savior who has conquered all by his death. And we pray that you would, you would bless the preaching of that word. And Lord, we recognize that we need wisdom. And we recognize that we have within us a deep desire and a loyalty to your word. But Father, help us to recognize that your gospel is not under our control. That we don't control the results but that you do. And so we want to pray that you, by your Spirit, would be working powerfully, not just in this place, not about building our kingdom, but that you, all over this city, all over this country, and all over this world, would be gathering people together who truly are loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ, who are willing to leave everything behind to follow him. And we do pray for those countries where there is a great deal of persecution. Or those countries where people are really forced to wrestle with the question, what matters most to me? Where it sometimes is a matter of life and death. And Father, we pray that you would give an incredible spirit of faithfulness. That their lives would stand forever as a testimony to the supernatural strength that you offer that they might bear their cross and follow Christ and in this way that you would be honored and that you would be glorified in so many different ways. Father, lead us, guide us, hold your church. Give us what we need. Fill us with your spirit. In Christ we pray. Amen.